This is Professor Raphael Chacon of the University of Montana, and this is the second part of a two-part lecture on the art and architecture of the ancient Americas, that is, America before 1492. In this half of the lecture, we focus on South America. Remember that the continent of the Americas is one continuum that flows from North America through the middle of the continent known as Mesoamerica by art historians, anthropologists, and archaeologists. And now we're going to focus on South America, particularly in coastal and highland Peru and parts of Bolivia. This is a place, a part of the world, that has been uh, cosmogonic. Civilizations have emerged here, risen and fallen, and it is a very important focal point for the development of civilization in the American continent. So predominantly, predominantly we will be focused on Peru from its, uh, its long coastline along the Pacific Ocean up into the highlands of the Andes Mountains. This is a topographical map showing us uh, basically what that terrain looks like. It's a highly improbable place for humanity to establish itself, let alone build great civilizations. And yet that is indeed what occurred here over the last uh, three to 4,000 years. Uh, an impressive array of civilizations have emerged in this region um, in what is now modern day Peru. The landmass here is characterized by a very narrow coastline. Uh, on the one hand, you have a very coastal, uh, a very rich coastal area, um, rich only because of the Peru current, which flows in from um, the uh, regions south of the of the of the planet, uh, bringing life, uh, all kinds of sea life and animal life, marine life along that coast. But it's also characterized by the precipitous rise of the Andes Mountains to the east, uh, mountains that are characterized by a lower um, a range of mountains known as the Cordillera Negra in Spanish, or the Black Range, followed by a broad plateau on Altiplano, or a high plateau, and then a sequence of even higher peaks to the east uh, known as the Cordillera Blanca, or the White uh, Range. Uh, these Spanish uh, colonial names uh, derive from, of course, the presence of snow in that higher altitude uh, set of mountains. But it is here between the heights of the Andes Mountains and the low-lying uh, valleys of the western uh, seaboard of Peru that uh, great civilizations established themselves, uh, prospered, warred against each other, and eventually collapsed. The first great civilization uh, that we can speak about in ancient Peru is known as Chavín de Huantar. Uh, that takes its name from a location, a place uh, that has been called the mother civilization of the Andes. And it's comparable to the Olmec civilization of ancient Mexico, a civilization that was discovered in the 1930s by Peruvian archeologists, uh, namely Julio Tello, um, and given that uh, nickname or sobriquet of the mother civilization of the Andes. There are most likely to have been preceding uh, cultures and civilizations, particularly at Chico Norte, uh, or Norte Chico, on the north coast of Peru. But none of, none of the predecessors uh, groups or societies that emerged there were as influential uh, as uh, the civilization that emerged at Chavín de Huantar. The, the Chavín itself has been described as a developmental stage in, uh, in civilization in Peru also as an archaeological period, an art style. It's been described variously as an empire, a civilization, a culture, and even a religion. What it actually was is still a mystery, although we can gauge uh, from archaeology that it was indeed a highly influential um, uh, culture that seems to have diffused itself along the uh, coast of Peru and into the highlands uh, proper. So we know that between 1200 and 200 BCE that it covered the coast from the Ica and Lambayeque valleys, uh, from the Pancopampa to Ayacucho in the highlands. Uh, the site itself is at 10,000 feet above sea level, and it lies between two rivers, the Mosna and Huachexa rivers. What is interesting about this location uh, is that it was most likely a ritual center. 
and there uh, a, an a apparently cosmogonic generative monster, uh, sometimes with feline and raptor attributes and often with agricultural associations, uh, emerges. And this deity seems to have been diffused from there to other secondary sites, both in the highlands and along the coast. That deity is now called the Staff God, uh, mainly because, um, because of what it holds. And it is indeed often shown holding a staff, or sometimes two staffs. Uh, we don't know the exact traits of this deity. All, all we know is that it was indeed a powerful uh, being, uh, and it seems to have been worshipped widely in Chavin's orbit. Um, again, we don't know who the ancient peoples of Chavin were, what language they spoke, or even what they called themselves, let alone what they called their deities. But the staff god, as he is known today, seems to have been an important presence in uh, all of their art. So this is an image showing us a view of the Cordillera Blanca, the sort of majestic uh, snowy peaks of the Andes Mountains uh, to the east of uh, Chavín de Huantar. And then a map on the right showing us the location of Chavín de Huantar in the central highlands there. Uh, and its, uh, its diffusion, the diffusion of its uh, style, its ideas, its influence along the north coast beyond Chan Chan and Cajamarca, and then along the south coast beyond Pachacamac, all the way down to the Nazca Desert. So recent studies have shown that there was an extensive network of underground tunnels uh, at Chavin itself. Uh, these uh, are about three miles long. So there was, in fact, ancient engineering that took place here. These tunnels are about 40 feet below the earth. And then atop those tunnels were platforms and structures, um, mounds or, uh, or pyramids, if you care to call them that, uh, which seem to have been important temple sites for this ancient civilization. Water, of course, was important to the site, uh, given that its location between these two rivers, which converge actually not far from the site itself. And it was there where ancient peoples produced beer, or chicha, as it was later be known in the Quechua language. Um, and it's also here that, that archaeologists have discovered evidence of the use of psychotropic drugs, uh, mortar and pestles, spatulas, bone tubes, uh, paraphernalia that was used in the processing and, and consumption of these psychotropic drugs. In particular, they focused on the San Pedro cactus, which is a um, hallucinogenic mescaline. And there is some evidence in uh, the imagery of Chavin that this might have been one of the hallucinogenics used at this, uh, at this ritual site. There's also some very recent studies that have focused on the acoustics of those tunnels and the mind-altering uh, spaces of the labyrinth beneath the site. These are views showing the principal structure at Chavin, uh, known as Temple A. And as you can see uh, from both of these photographs, it was a very, very large, impressive construction. Um, hundreds of people must have been employed here, perhaps over long periods of time, to create the massive, massive structure uh, that exists there today. Uh, the site is an active archaeological zone uh, today. And this is a drawing, a diagram, showing us a reconstruction of what that site may have looked, uh, may have looked like. Uh, these temples uh, may have started in an older section that you can see there in the upper right-hand part of your screen. Later, uh, additions were added uh, towards the left side of the screen, allowing a U-shaped courtyard to form between them. And there is indeed an oval uh, sunken plaza in between. That plot, the, the presence of plazas indicates that people gathered here in large numbers, uh, surrounded uh, in proximity to their temples, and uh, surrounded possibly by, uh, by the deities themselves. Those plazas would then extend further uh, on other sides of the newer section of the temple, of Temple A. And there you can see that there are other sunken plazas in front and other secondary structures that were actually built as other temples uh, uh, expanded. Um, the presence of this staff god or this deity is everywhere in Chavín de Huancar, and particularly on the exterior of the buildings. For example, there you have an image of one of the walls of the of Temple A showing us a tenon head, and scores of these have actually been found uh, at this location. These heads were inserted into the wall, and they seem to, uh, to repeat a theme. That is a mask-like face with huge, uh, huge goggle eyes, 
a very large nose, and oftentimes a large maw or mouth uh, with uh, often toothed. Uh, the figure seems to be almost grinning, uh, but indeed this is a powerful presence, um, and all these attributes seem to be um, carved in low relief seem to be attributes of great power associated with this being. This is, in fact, the staff god. The staff god also appears in relief, um, and this is a very famous stella, or carved slab of stone, uh, about six feet high. And this is known as the Raimondi stella, named after the archaeologist who discovered it. Very, very impressive image. And indeed, it shows us an anthropomorphic figure down in the lower uh, quadrant of the, of the sculpture uh, in relatively flat or low relief, bas relief, to use the French term. And it shows us, in fact, a figure with a similar face, the large eyes, the expressive mouth with the, uh, with the, the teeth uh, and the fangs. And then it has, in fact, a body, a torso, uh, wearing a belt, often with snakes wrapped around its waist. And then this, in this case, the figure is holding twin staffs, um, which could be an indication of ancient agriculture. Sometimes the staffs seem to be blooming like plants. Uh, so it, it could be indeed batons of power and rulership and leadership, or they could allude to an uh, agricultural function. What is clear is that this is a powerful, powerful being. In fact, if you notice the head of the, of the figure in the Raimondi Stella, that the theme of that head repeats over and over and over again in this very, very large headdress, uh, that the figure could be turned. And if it's flipped over, it, it takes on almost the presence of a centipede or some kind of a multi-partite uh, multi, uh, creature. Uh, these all seem to be to indicate uh, elements of power identified with this being. And the being's likeness is repeated over and over again at the site in numerous uh, media. For example, those are textile fragments on the upper part of the screen uh, with the image of the likeness of the staff god painted on it. Uh, notice the, uh, the proliferation of plants and animals, particularly serpentine forms that come out of its head. Uh, and seem to be blooming all around it. Uh, in the image on the right, which is a diagram taken from a carved relief, uh, what you notice is that the, the attributes of power and growth and fertility seem to be uh, pervasive, covering the figure from head uh, to toe. Here is a carved slab, um, in, again in low relief, showing that principal deity or the staff god. And this comes from the circular plaza, uh, in front of the, uh, between the older and newer sections of the, uh, of Temple A. Here's another one showing the figure having, on, um, on the left you see the carved slab and on the right diagrams of uh, similar slabs. Uh, and what they show is the figure having uh, uh, bird-like properties. So it has its head tilted upward and it's actually beaked, uh, uh, much like a condor or a large bird of prey. Uh, the figure is also winged. So what seems to be apparent here is that this creature uh, uh, evolves or it trans uh, transfigures itself and it takes on the attributes of powerful creatures both avian and, uh, and, uh, and mammalian. So we have bird-like attributes in these particular sets, and in others we'll have more serpentine or, or, or feline properties. Here we see the figure uh, of the staff god uh, more explicitly as a feline. Now again, archaeologists don't know precisely what the imagery uh, means. Uh, or if these are different deities or different manifestations of one principal deity. Again, more carved images. In this case, on the, on the left, a more feline uh, figure. This is a spotted cat. Uh, again, these would have been large predators in the, the highlands of the Andes. And on the right, we have a gold plaque, evidence of metallurgy. And this would have probably been strung up and worn on, uh, on an outfit or uh, or worn around the neck as a piece of jewelry. And we see that image carved also in, uh, in carved bowls, like the bowl made out of steatite that we see there on the left. It actually shows us the figure, uh, again, the torso of the figure on the bottom of the pot, uh, its paws, its legs uh, coming off, the head, again, looking up to, uh, to the heavens, turned upward. And then we see it on the figure on the route in this uh, fabulous stirrup spout pot. 
uh, etched into the sides of it. Uh, and this, it's the figure of the staff god uh, shown in profile. So what is actually quite spectacular about the site of Chavin are the structures, um, these very large massive structures. But again, remember that there is a network of, of channels or tunnels that uh, underneath the, the, the site, the buildings themselves and the plazas. And what these channels do is they bring water in from the two rivers that flank the site. And that water is used most likely in the production of chicha and, uh, and perhaps used in, uh, in ceremonial ways and then, uh, and then discarded into the rivers themselves. Uh, so imagine that these structures have a network of tunnels underneath uh, which are sometimes flooded by water from the neighboring rivers. And it's in one of those tunnels where archaeologists found a very impressive sculpture. And this is believed to be a sacred stone, a very large monolithic uh, uh, work of art. It is known as the Lanzon, which is the Spanish word for great lance. So we have an enormous uh, uh, carved piece of stone inset in the tunnels beneath uh, the great temple, uh, actually beneath Temple B, or called the Old Temple, at uh, Chavín de Huantar. And these are images of that structure being photographed. Here is one of the photographs on the right showing us the Lanzón, and there a reconstruction of that sculpture uh, that exists in the national capital in Lima. Um, the image shows us the, uh, it's a very narrow sliver of a stone, and yet it is carved with the image of the staff god on both sides of it. Um, so there we have um, the, the left side of the face, or the face of the Lanzón in, in profile. So Chavín seems to have generated a number of later civilizations uh, over the course of the next, uh, after its collapse. Uh, other civilizations emerged in the Andes from the coast all the way up into the, um, into the highlands and possibly beyond the Andes into the Amazon basin, uh, which drains those, um, those great mountains to the Atlantic Ocean. And it was in this location then, therefore, between the Amazon Basin, the Andes Mountains, its high plateau, and uh, the coastline where civilizations would rise and fall. The last great civilization of this part of the Americas was the Inca Empire. And it would be eventually toppled in the 16th century by the Spanish Empire. So Europeans arrived here in the 16th century and uh, when the Inca Empire was in fact engaged in a civil war between two rival Incas or rulers and uh, the Spaniards took advantage of that situation and eventually toppled this last great indigenous empire of uh, South America. The Inca Empire was indeed a complex and, uh, and powerful entity in this part of the world. Um, it was a latecomer uh, only emerging in, uh, in the city of Cusco in the 13th century. Most scholars believe that it emerged somewhere in the borderlands between uh, the Amazon and modern day Bolivia, uh, and that they rose to power in uh, the, the Great Valley uh, in the city uh, which is now called Cusco. Their king, or Inca, was in fact a divine descendant of their principal deity, Viracocha who was the son of Inti, or, uh, or the son itself. Um, the primordial couple, that is the founders of the Inca state, were a husband and wife, brother-sister duo, Mama Okio and Manco Capac. And apparently these are the two individuals who founded the Inca dynasty in Cusco. There is a great myth that, in fact, um, the god Viracocha gave Manco Capac a golden staff and told him to launch that staff uh, into the earth. And where the staff sank into the earth, indicating its fertility, uh, and disappeared, that is where, indeed, the Incas should establish themselves. So imagine a migratory group of people moving out of the Amazon basin into the highlands of Peru, seeking, in fact, a place to, uh, to uh, establish themselves, looking certainly for fertile land in which to do that. Apparently, the brother-sister couple and three other pairs of siblings established the Inca nation in what is now modern-day Cusco, 
when Manco Capac's golden staff disappeared into the ground at this particular location. From there, starting in the 13th century, an empire emerges, they began to conquer their neighbors, and they began to apply their sense of power and their, uh, their language, their policies, their laws um, throughout the highlands of Peru, down into the coast and into the Amazon basin proper. They diffused their language, the Quechua language, uh, and they exacted uh, taxes um, and also labor from the people that they enslaved. Uh, it was a highly centralized state with a military and a priesthood, all of which was, were controlled by the Inca himself. Uh, it was a state uh, governed um, through religion and through military force and might. It was a state that we know involved uh, uh, a religion uh, characterized by pilgrimage and occasional human sacrifice. So the Inca are best known for the network of roads and engineering and architecture, public works that connected the, uh, the entire uh, empire from modern day Ecuador down to uh, modern day Chile. Um, this region was characterized by great public works uh, agricultural terraces, irrigation projects, warehouses, and this architecture was used clearly as demonstrations of power and, and control by the Inca state. The state itself was governed by a ruling house uh, that concentrated wealth and power in itself. The king, or the Inca, had a, uh, was the leader of a royal family and, inclu uh, and included a large harem um, brides or nustas, potential spouses and wa uh, mothers of his children, uh, surrounded by military leaders and priests who governed the society. The rest of the society were um, variously called serfs or slaves. Every major industry, the textile industry, the, um, the camelid industry, agriculture certainly, uh, fishing, trading, all of those networks were in fact controlled by the Inca state. And this was all true until 1532 when the empire was toppled by the Spaniards under the conquistador Francisco Pizarro. These are two images. They're fanciful depictions uh, from the colonial period showing us on the left an image of Manco Capac, the founder of the Inca dynasty. Um, and that's from a very famous um, uh, manuscript, colonial manuscript from, uh, from Peru. And on the right, a Baroque painting showing us uh, Manco Capac with an image of Inti the Sun, his creator uh, uh, to his upper left. And these two diagrams show us the empire itself as being divided into four regions. Uh, the empires take, took its name from these four regions. It was the Inca Empire was known as Tawantansuyu, that is the land divided into four quadrants. And uh, so the map on the right actually shows us uh, Cusco in the center um, uh, as ruling uh, uh, as the center of the empire, and from there ruling four great regions uh, that compose the empire. The map on the left shows us some of the predecessor societies to the Inca. So it's more than likely that the Inca took over areas that had been developed by previous civilizations and, uh, and absorbed them into its own, uh, its own empire, took its power, took the, their power and greatness and absorbed it and assimilated it into its own sense of destiny. Uh, on the left you have a map showing us the, the, the way the four quadrants of the empire, the four regions of the empire were connected with major highways running through the Altiplano and certainly along the coast. Uh, some historians have argued that uh, South America was never better connected than it was in Inca times under the rulership of the Inca state. And these are images of the network of roads that connected the empire. So this is a, a, an image of the engineering projects, uh, road building projects that the em empire was engaged in uh, starting in the 13th century and continuing into colonial times. On the right, the famous andenes or terraces that were used to farm in uh, high elevation locations in mountainous regions. 
Peru also has the distinction of having been the birthplace of the potato, and not just any potato, but all kinds of varieties of potatoes. Uh, Peruvian city boasts the fact that hundreds of varieties and coming uh, in all kinds of colors, uh, densities growing in all kinds of regions from the, the coastland up into the high elevation sites. Uh, Peru is indeed the place that gave uh, rise to the potato as a food sto uh, foodstuff. And it was the primary starch of certainly the Inca Empire and its predecessor societies in Peru, Bolivia, and this part of South America. This is, these are uh, the ruins of a warehouse at a site known as Huinahuayna. Uh, and again, showing us some of the precarious constructions of the Inca, the magnificent uh, constructions of the Inca, uh, often in precarious sites. Um, this is a warehouse that has lost its roof and its timbers, and yet the walls and the structure of the place give you a sense of its, uh, its importance uh, as a, a, a location to store foodstuffs, materials, and to take shelter from the elements. Probably the most uh, famous site of all in, uh, in the Inca world is the site known as Machu Picchu, uh, which was discovered uh, in the early 20th century by American archaeologists working in, in Peru. Uh, the site was excavated and reconstructed in part um, uh, uh, starting in the early 20th century. And, um, and it's a site that has continued to reveal lots of information about the Inca proper. Uh, although the specifics as to how the site was used are, are still unknown. Uh, most likely it was a ceremonial site uh, built uh, uh, in the Urubamba Valley, uh, uh, perched atop um, in a saddle of uh, very dramatic peaks surrounded by uh, important peaks, which apparently the Inca venerated as, uh, as deities themselves. Uh, the Inca believed that uh, stones were sacred and that they embodied, in fact, uh, spiritual forces. They named uh, stones uh, wakas, and wakas could be a, uh, a carved stone, it could be a natural stone, it could be a mountain peak. A waka was a manifestation of divine energy, divine force in the landscape. This is, for example, a waka. This is a, uh, a stone that was set up uh, between twin temples at Machu Picchu. Um, but notice what happens when the clouds clear in uh, beyond the valley below. What one realizes is that this large uh, slab of stone was intentionally set up and carved to mimic the peak in the distance. So it is in fact a manifestation of perhaps a divine entity, a divine being, divine energy in the waka itself. But it addresses the power, the majesty, and the spiritual power of the site across the valley. So the temples that you see left and right were there most likely to worship uh, as a place of worship for the wakas uh, that we see here at Machu Picchu. We also know that the Inca uh, performed human sacrifice, so they were in, uh, in constant dialogue with the deities and the natural forces in, of the universe. Um, and they often left uh, sacrifice, often human sacrifice at those sites. For example, this is a site known as, uh, this are objects from a site known as the Cerro El Plomo in uh, the Chilean uh, Yandes Mountains. And what it shows us is in fact a, a young child, uh, most likely around the age of 11 or 12, who was ritually sacrificed um, and left at a uh, high altitude snowbound site in uh, the Cerro El Plomo in, uh, in modern day Chile. The child uh, was apparently well fed, well taken care of and drugged up prior to, uh, to receiving a large blow to the head. And then she was ritually laid to rest uh, as an offering uh, to the gods, most likely uh, gods associated with mountain peaks and, uh, and storms that brew in the mountains. And the child was left with uh, textiles and also uh, an array of ceremonial objects and offerings uh, as well, including small figurines with their own mini textiles and mini uh, pieces of jewelry. All of these were indications of sacrifice and worship of the gods and gifts to the gods. The textile industry seems to have been very important to ancient Peruvians, um, including the Inca Empire, which monopolized uh, the, uh, the weaving of these fabulous textiles. 
Uh, the screen shows us two tunics, uh, two Inca tunics, left and right, uh, made out of wool, camelid wool, so probably from uh, llamas, vicuñas, or alpacas. Uh, and these textiles were woven on a backstrap loom, uh, most likely by one or two uh, individuals. Uh, and what we see here is a, a series of patterns that are believed to be uh, clan lineages. So whoever wore these textiles, who, whoever uh, owned this textile and had um, his or her body wrapped uh, at the time of burial, uh, most likely was an Inca aristocrat uh, with a very important, impressive uh, pedigree. And that's visible in the uh, abstract imagery that we see on the textile proper. That, uh, that use of those textiles and identification of the textiles with uh, the Inca aristocracy is visible in the colonial period. We know that the Spaniards encouraged intermarriage between Spanish elites and Inca elites, and that's indeed what this painting from, this Baroque painting from the late 18th century uh, reveals to us, the late 17th century, excuse me. Uh, this was painted in Cusco during the colonial period, and it shows us the marriage of a Spanish uh, grandee by the name of Don Martin de Loyola, and an Inca, the descendant of Inca lords or rulers. Uh, so this is an image of the Inca Nusta Beatriz, at her marriage to Don Martin de Loyola. Receiving all the full blessings of their respective families, on the one hand Spanish, and then Inca on the left, and also the blessings of the church, the Catholic church, and the saints uh, in heaven. Here's another image of the same subject, and again we have Don Martin de Loyola, and his bride, the Inca Nusta Beatriz, uh, being ma married, the presence of uh, saints, um, in this case, um, saints identified with St. Ignatius Loyola and uh, Spanish uh, uh, members of the Spanish court to the right, uh, and then the church representatives of the church in the upper right-hand corner, and then representatives of the Inca elite, the traditional rulers of these lands in the upper left-hand quadrant, the family of the Inca Nusta Beatriz. So this is a view showing us the magnificent uh, settlement of Cusco. And you'll notice that at the heart of Cusco is an open plaza. This is, of course, the capital of the old Inca Empire. It later will become an important colonial seat for the Spanish Empire as well, although they located their capital down in the coast along the Rio Rimac. They established the city of Lima, which is the current uh, political capital of Peru. Nevertheless, Cusco uh, was the spiritual heartland of the Inca Empire, an ancient city, but a city that was built up during Inca times and given its, uh, its uh, privileged status as the capital of the, the great four-quartered empire. You'll notice that at the heart of, uh, of Cusco is an open plaza. And this is the plaza, this is the location where, uh, according to the great myth of its foundation, Manco Capac, through his lance and the lance fell into the earth and disappeared into the earth, a great sign of fertility. Uh, scholars will tell us that the Inca apparently, or the ancestors of the Inca had to go to war to take possession of these lands, but it was here on that square where they see their origins. Uh, today it currently houses um, uh, buildings related to the colonial period, the great uh, uh, Jesuit Church, as well as the Cathedral of Cusco. Those are the two large structures you see there. And royal palaces of the local governors and the local Spanish aristocrats who ruled here. The city is in fact an ancient city, and it's believed that its ultimate diagram uh, mimicked the, the, uh, the, uh, what we see at Chavín de Huanta. So it, it lies between two great rivers which converge uh, in, the, uh, in the extremities in, in, at one end. Other people have noted that the building is in the shape of a puma. So we have at the, at the head of this beast uh, a large fortress, the Sacsayhuaman Fortress, and then the heart of the city where the Great Square is indeed the center of the torso of the puma. Today, it's a, ma it's a magnificent city, which shows us the syncretism of ancient civilization and colonial uh, civilization. So we have a, a, uh, a substructure, that is the, the foot plan of the city, 
uh, as, uh, as Inca. So for example, you see a colonnade there. Beyond, behind that colonnade is in fact a wall of palaces that were along, this, um, along this, um, this great plaza at the heart of the city. Those are Inca palaces. The colonnade itself was built in the Renaissance and the superstructure that you see above are all colonial buildings in the Spanish style built in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. So the city is in fact uh, a uh, evidence, uh, great evidence of the syncretism that took place here during the colonial period where uh, Christianity and, Spanish, and uh, Spanish ways and administration overlaid atop uh, the ancient Inca uh, city, taking advantage of the majesty and authority of the Inca construction that was already there. This is a very famous uh, street uh, known as the Archbishop Street in uh, in Cusco, and uh, what we see along streets like this are uh, evidence of the great masonry identified with Inca engineers. This is a particularly beautiful stone. It's known as the 12-sided stone, um, a famous uh, block uh, carefully inserted into a, a wall of an Inca structure. There's another uh, magnificent site in ancient uh, Cusco, and this is uh, currently the monastery of Santo Domingo. It's an active uh, monastery, and as you can see from the image on the left, it's a colonial structure built uh, by the Spaniards, built and rebuilt because it has suffered uh, devastation under numerous earthquakes that happened here. But it is built directly atop an ancient Inca temple known as the Golden House of the Sun. So there was a temple to the uh, sun god Inti and his son Viracocha that was, um, that was originally at the site. And the platforms that you see there are in fact constructions from that time. And that amazing smooth wall is indeed evidence of that uh, Inca construction. And atop we see a colonial building in the Renaissance style uh, with its uh, uh, bell towers and courtyards and uh, domed uh, chapels. Uh, here's that structure from a different view, and we see again Inca terraces uh, to the right of the structure, Inca walls, and then the superstructure which was built in the colonial times up above. The photograph in black and white on the right is an earlier image of that, uh, of that site. The image on the lower left is indeed the, the, the site as it looks today. And here's, uh, here are photographs of the uh, Temple of the Sun, the Golden Temple of the Sun, uh, which is below, beneath the Monastery of Santo Domingo in Cusco today. Now, I want to show you, uh, to, to finish off this discussion, the continuity of these themes and these ideas. So the kind of public religion that existed in Inca times uh, was replaced by Christianity. Um, uh, the worship of gods, in, uh, excuse me, the worship of saints replaced the worship of many gods in, uh, in Inca times. And so Christianity overlaid itself on the piety and the belief systems of the, uh, the predecessors in ancient Peru, Bolivia, and this part of South America. This is a small chapel in the highlands of Peru, and it shows us a typical Spanish Baroque chapel with its uh, gilded reredo, uh, that is an altar piece. Um, it's a, it's a, we have the altar table where the mass is actually said, and then behind it is a retable or a reredo, which uh, uh, combines uh, carved architecture um, and sometimes sculpture often gilded with um, uh, uh, covered in gold leaf and then also infilled with sculptures and paintings of the Christian saints and stories. There's a particularly wonderful set of stories that are told uh, in, um, in Peru uh, and they are accompanied by paintings and these are images of the Christian archangels and of course archangels are biblical uh, figures that, are, that appear in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible, and then reappear throughout uh, Christian mythology. Um, these uh, images, or these uh, archangels, were given form in the Baroque age, that is, in the colonial period in Peru, um, in these very fanciful paintings. So for example, this is a painting of the angel Arch Archibus, um, uh, known as Elio. So he would have been one of the, uh, the archangels from the Hebrew Bible. But here he's represented actually as a Spanish grandee in a Baroque finery. 
And these are two other sort of uh, lower class versions of the same subject. This is Aziel Timor Dei and Uriel Lumen Dei. So uh, angelic figures uh, represented here as Spaniards wearing Baroque finery and typically wielding Spanish weapons. Now, these are a very interesting syncretism. This is the idea that you have Indian artists employed by uh, Christian patrons in ancient Peru, in the highlands of Peru, uh, mostly in the Lake Titicaca region of Peru and Bolivia, uh, employing Indian artists to represent images of uh, Christian heroes, in this case, archangels, um, but dressing them up in the finery, in the clothing, uh, with the attributes of Spanish hunters and Spanish aristocrats. And what historians have told us is that what we have here is in fact the coming together of multiple sources. So we have Indian artisans employed by um, Christian patrons uh, using and perhaps uh, looking at, at uh, sample guidebooks, um, pattern books uh, from the Baroque age brought to, uh, to distant Peru from the homeland of Spain. So here are some of the weapons and the clothing that we see in a 17th century manuscript uh, of Spanish soldiers. And it's these images that were then conflated with religious themes uh, at the hands of Indian artists working for the Christian church in ancient Peru. Some more images, in this case, these are from Holland or perhaps from Germany, uh, showing us uh, similar uh, kinds of uh, sources for the famous uh, paintings of archangels that we see in Baroque Peru. And on that note, we will end our discussion of Peru before and slightly after 1492.